We're now going to turn to Romans uh, chapter, chapter 6. If you have your own Bibles, uh, please open them to Romans chapter 6. So we're going to read the first seven verses of chapter 6. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptised into Christ, Jesus were baptised into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united together in in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. May the Lord bless to us the reading of his word. Would you pray with me? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for these words from the Apostle Paul. And Lord, we just ask that you would give us even further understanding of what these few verses mean. We pray that your Holy Spirit would Come and teach us and reveal to us the true meaning of your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week we looked at uh, at a question that Paul asks in uh, verse 1. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? As we continue to look at this question, Paul has already said something quite remarkable back in Romans Chapter 5, verse 20 to 21, which is on the next slide there, uh, guys. Thank you. Moreover, the law entered that the offence might abound. But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, this statement back in chapter 5 was both, um, it was shocking both to Jews who were Christian and of course Jews who were not Christian. The idea that the law came in order that sin might increase. And he said something that even shocked them even more when he said where sin increased, grace abounded. That is grace increased all the more. Now these early hearers would have initially been confused by these statements and they can be confusing to us as well. We'll try and unpack it a little bit further this morning. In addition, they feared they feared that Paul's teaching would lead to this big word that I uh, said last week, antinomianism, to wild uh, lefisious uh, behaviour, that is uh, free behaviour based upon the idea that if sin increases, then grace abounds all the more. Therefore, why not continue to sin so that we can have more grace? But in Romans chapter 5, verse 21, which is up on the screen, Paul had already corrected these misunderstandings when he explained that grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Grace reigns over sin. It reigns in the righteousness of Christ. Christ reigns by his mediation that leads, of course, to eternal life. So when we come to Romans chapter 6, verse 1, Paul is he's arguing here to counter those who haven't understood Romans 5, verse 21. Because someone continues this question, they, they continue to question his teaching, Paul's teaching. And so in verse 1, Paul's question reveals both an objection and also a misunderstanding to his teaching. But as we consider this question, I want to ask you, 
I want to ask you something a little bit different. Why is the resurrection of Jesus Christ so important? Can you answer this? Now, you could answer that the resurrection proved that Jesus was who he said he was. Jesus' resurrection was the proof that he was indeed the Messiah, the Son of the living God, the Saviour of the world, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And since he rose from the dead, it proved that all he said about himself was indeed true. Now, this would be a good biblical answer, although slightly incomplete. Some others might say that if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then we'd never know that his um, atoning, substitutionary sacrifice for sin was ever accepted by God the Father, which makes the resurrection the evidence of his victory over sin, that the Father accepted Jesus' death as the due, the due penalty for payment of sin. Now, of course, this is another reasonable answer. But Paul is giving his emphasis here that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the source of both our justification and our sanctification. The resurrection of Jesus is the source of our being accepted by God the Father. It is the source of our being credited as not guilty by God the Father. It is the source of our being forgiven. But the resurrection is also the source of our transformation. Our transformation. Not only are we declared righteous before God, but we're also transformed into righteousness by the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. For the believer, the resurrection is a fountain to new life, to new life. So Paul is using the resurrection of Christ to counter the terrible misunderstanding of his teaching and a serious objection to his, to his teaching. In Romans 5.20, Paul suggests that where sin abounded, grace abounded all the more. And of course, there are two responses to Paul's teaching some people said, Paul, you're teaching us about grace, that God saves us on the basis of God's grace, not, only, not upon any of our own works or our own righteousness. That's your emphasis about what you're teaching us about justification. You're saying that our works contribute nothing to being accepted by God. Rather, it is who God uh, it is God who justifies us freely as we simply trust in Jesus Christ. Now, Paul, if you teach this, people will live immoral lives. That was the objection Paul was hearing. Paul, you're saying that I can be accepted by, by God apart from my own personal righteousness. They objected to this teaching because it will lead people to live immoral and godless lives. It will lead uh, the people to dishonour God's law rather than seeking after god godliness and holiness. And, of course, there are churches today that place an emphasis on, on your own personal holiness in order to be saved. That salvation is not by grace alone. It's by grace plus works. They teach that justification is not by faith alone. It's by faith plus works. Now, Paul's teaching on, uh, on justification leaves our works out. It leaves our works out of our justification of us being saved. If a church teaches that works are required to be justified, then it isn't Paul's teaching. You can be sure of that. If Paul was teaching that justification was by faith plus works, then someone would have come and uh, they would have stated well, shouldn't we continue to sin so that grace might increase? But Paul isn't teaching that justification is by faith plus works. So he cops this objection. So one response that Paul is getting is your teaching is going to lead to, to uh, moral lawlessness. 
Now, the other response to Paul's teaching is that we can go ahead and sin so that grace can abound even more, all the more. Some people were libertines who freely indulge in sensual pleasures without regard to moral principles. And there were some who were legalists who accused Paul of downplaying the law and the necessity of holiness. But the libertines were people who wanted to be saved but still but still they wanted to live however they wanted to live. You're saying a person is saved by grace. If grace abounds where sin abounds, then you can live however you want. Now, Paul's response to these misinterpretations from Romans chapter 5, verse 20 to 21, now comes in chapter 6. So in helping to answer the question posed in Romans 6, verse 1, Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? I want you to see why the resurrection is so important. I want us to see. In verses 1 to 2, he says, you're not going to continue in sin that grace might increase because of who you are, of who you are. In verses 3 to 4, he says, you're not going to continue in sin that grace might increase because I want you to think about the meaning of your baptism. And in verses 5 to 7, he says, you're not going to continue in sin that grace might increase because of the decisive transformation in our lives brought on by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So when Paul asks, uh, when he asks this question in verse 1, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound, he then answers the, answers the, the question in verse 2 by asking another question. How shall we who, who died to sin live any longer in it? Now I want you to go back to the reading page. Just drop down the page to the reading. Go back one page so that our readings are up on the screen. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? And Paul wants us firstly to respond to the thought of whether we are free to continue in sin by remembering who we are. If you think about who you are in Jesus Christ, then you'll immediately answer with a definite no. Paul tells us that a Christian is a person who has died to sin. So if we are continuing in sin, then this is a contradiction of who we are, of God's grace. It's a contradiction of God's grace and the purposes of God's grace in our lives. It's an utter contradiction to go on sinning, to live a life of sin, having died to it to suggest that you can go on sinning so you can receive more grace when you're a person who has died to sin. Paul is talking about, here about what happens when a person is united to Christ in our union with Christ. The reason the believer has died to sin is because he is united to Christ. In union with Christ, the believer dies to the penalty and the power of sin. The penalty of sin is broken to the believer up to this point. So when considering the first question, shouldn't we go on sinning so that grace might increase? Paul's answer is, think about who you are. Think about who you are. That's what Paul's answer is. You're a person united to Christ and therefore you died to sin. In verses 3 to 4, he now points us to our baptism, to stop and to reflect. What does your baptism mean? He's reminding us of the significance and what our baptism actually symbolises. And so he says in verses 3 and 4, he says this, Do you not know that as many of us as as were baptised into Christ Jesus were baptised into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in newness of life. Remember you were baptised into Christ's death. Now reflect upon this. 
First, you were baptised into Christ, and second, you were baptised into his death. In verse 3, he asked another question. Don't you know that all of us who have been baptised into Jesus Christ have been baptised into his death? Why is Paul turning us to the subject of baptism? If you're a believer, you died to sin. So when was it that as a believer you died to sin? Paul says, consider your baptism. Paul isn't saying that water baptism saves you. However it was administered, whether it was by immersion, sprinkling or pouring to infants or adults, this isn't Paul's point here. Nor is he saying that your water baptism is the means that unites you to Christ. But what he is saying is that water baptism is a symbol of our union with Christ. That's one thing that baptism symbolises and signifies. So when did we die to sin? Paul is de- directing us to our union with Christ and is pointing us to the sacrament of baptism, which illustrates our union with Christ. And he says, don't you know that everyone who has been baptised is baptised into Christ, therefore into his person? If we're baptised into, into Christ, we're baptised into his person, we're baptised into his death and into his work. And think of his work. His work was to die on the cross to take the penalty of our sin. Now, thinking about that, when you were baptised into Christ, Paul is reminding you that sin is no longer the master over you. It is Christ who is master over you. No longer is sin your Lord. Christ is your Lord and this is symbolised in your baptism. You are not under the dominion of sin or the condemnation of the law. You are now living in the dominion of our Lord Jesus Christ under his reign of free grace so that your baptism shows that you shouldn't continue in sin so that grace might increase because you're not in the dominion of sin. You're under the dominion of your Lord. You are baptised into Christ into his person, you're bound to him and bound with him. You're in covenant with him. You're united with him. You're a beneficiary of Jesus' work and you're baptised into his death. Christ's person and work can never be separated. So if you were baptised into Christ, then you're also a beneficiary of his work and one of his great works was his death. His death was to break the power of sin, not only the penalty, but also the power of sin. Sin's power is broken in our lives because we are united to Christ in his death. Now think about Christ's crucifixion and his death. Jesus was crucified, he died and was buried. If you've been crucified, you are good and dead. If you have died... You are good and dead. If you've been buried, you are good and dead. Death brings an end with the life that has gone before it. So if if you've been baptised, your baptism reflects, reflects the reality that the Holy Spirit brings into your heart. Your Your baptism testifies to your death, to sin and its domain and power. And the positive note is that your baptism points to this ability that we might walk in the newness of life. Even so, verse 4 says, even so we also should walk in newness of life. This newness of life, this break with sin is not temporary. It's permanent because Christ was raised never to die again. And because we are united to to Christ, we are dead to sin and alive to God. So Paul is pointing here to the resurrection. So should we continue in sin? Well, Paul says, remember your baptism. Your baptism symbolises what your union with Christ brings. It brings about death to sin, the breaking of the dominion of sin. When a person slips in a world of sin, 
if the result of sin leads to the tearing down of relationships, or if, it, if, it, if the result of your sin leads to illegal behaviour, we, we so often excuse it, don't we? We say there were mitigating circumstances. A judge may even be merciful and he lets a person off the hook. However, the, jo- the judge cannot help with your life. He cannot help with your family or your work or your vocation or your habit, whatever that may be. You're going to have to help yourself. That's what he says. He says perhaps you should get some therapy and help yourself to deal with all the problems that you have. That's all a kind judge can do. But he can't change your life. He can't fix it. He can't repair your marriage or fix your career or whatever your problem is. But God isn't, going, isn't doing this when you're, you were saved. He's not doing this. When Paul talks about resurrection power, Paul says when God forgives you, he doesn't call you, call you into his court and say there's some mitigating circumstances and I'm going to let you off the hook. But you have to overcome your problems on your own. He doesn't say that. That's not the picture that we have here. First of all, You're pulled into court and God says, okay, I've read the case. There are no mitigating circumstances. You deserve punishment. But because my son Jesus lived his perfect life, he died and was punished on your behalf and he rose again, I'm going to spare you. I'm going to forgive you. Your slate is clean and I'm not going to send you out into life to live on your own because you can't. What you need is a new life. You're dead in sin. I'm now going to give you a new life. I'm going to give you a new life in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This new life in you will bring about a total life transformation. Now, when we come to verses 5 to 7, Paul points us to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Paul is looking at resurrection power as he talks about the definite change that comes to a believer. Verse 5 says this, For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Paul isn't just talking about the resurrection to come here. Paul is talking about the first resurrection that is granted to us now. As believers, we experience the first resurrection before we experience the first death. Believers are raised to newness of life with Christ when we first believe in and upon him. We are granted a foretaste of resurrection glory and power in our present experience so that we are no longer under the dominion of sin and its domination. Paul is telling us that the believer, if you've died with him, you've been buried with him, then surely you'll be raised in his likeness. Paul isn't just talking about someday in the future, which we all look forward to, by the way, I know. He's talking about the present. He's talking about the now. This is the first resurrection. John talks about this in Revelation 20. Paul talks about it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. You see, when you believe on Jesus Christ, God grants you a new life that flows from the resurrection of Christ. And this new life is yours because you're united to Christ. Does it mean that you'll never sin? Does it mean that you'll never have a desire to sin? Well, in in time, we'll we'll get to Romans chapter 7. Does it mean that you are no longer under dominion of sin? Yes, certainly. As a believer, you've been granted the the new life in Jesus Christ. So So for believers, there are two resurrections. Our final and second resurrection occurs when Jesus returns and people are raised from the dead. However, our first resurrection is just as significant and true. The resurrection of newness of life. And then later the resurrection that is to come when the body is united with the spirit and with Christ forever. 
God made the son of his love, who is the object of his love, to be the object of his wrath so that we who were the objects of his wrath might be made the sons of his love. And he did this so that we would be made to be like the son of his love. In the Gospels, people react to Jesus in many different ways. Remember the centurion at the foot of the cross. The crowds are dispersing. The disciples have left. Some of them never even turned up. And then an earthquake happens. And this centurion standing there observes and declares, surely this man was the son of God. And remember after Jesus' resurrection when the disciples saw the resurrected Christ, but Thomas wasn't there. And Thomas wouldn't believe that Jesus had risen. And a week later he's standing before Jesus who's displaying the wounds of his crucifixion. Put your fingers in my wounds, Thomas, Jesus says. Now, we're never told whether Thomas did this, but he falls down before his Lord and says, my Lord and my God. There are many reactions to Jesus Christ. How should we react to Jesus when we see the glory of his person? Do we say, what kind of a father has a son like this in his glory? You see, God the Father wants people to ask the same question when they see you. He wants them to say, what kind of father does she or he have? Because the resurrection of life, the resurrection life of Christ in us remakes us. It remakes us. It reshapes us into his likeness. That's what Paul says in Romans Chapter 6, verse 5, if we're made into his likeness, then what is that likeness? It's the very image and exact representation of his heavenly father. In Colossians, Colossians 1, it says he makes us to be like him. He morally conforms us to his image. And Paul is saying that by the resurrection of Jesus Christ and by our union with him, we are broken free from the power and the domination of sin. How do we break the domination of sin in our lives? Sin becomes habitual, doesn't it? People become addicted to it, just like a drug addict becoming addicted and the habit dominates that person's life. But as believers, we don't believe that we're under the domination of sin anymore, the dominion of sin. If if we are apart from Jesus Christ, then we will be under the dominion of sin. Paul is making it clear that if Christ has no part of you, that if you are under sin and you're willing, you're a willing slave to it, then you're just as much dominated by it like an addict. You're just as desperate. And so it makes sense to say to you, you need to do do better or pick yourselves up by your bootstraps. Friends, we all need, we can't do this, by the way, we can't pick ourselves up by our bootstraps. Friends, what we all need is the new life, the new life that comes from outside of us. It comes from outside of us and it comes by the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. God doesn't just save and forgive you and then he says you can take it from here. You're all on your own. God saves and forgives you and he grants you a new life so that you might walk in it. Justification and liberation go hand in hand. You see, the Father wants all of us to look like his son. We're not only forgiven but we're transformed by Jesus So if you've never experienced that forgiving and loving, transforming power, then there's good news for you. All you have to do is repent of your sin and trust in Jesus Christ. In repenting, you're turning away from yourself and you're turning to him. You're recognising that you're, you're a mess. You're the problem. You have no solutions in your, in your situation. You must only hold out the empty hand of faith. 
and beg for mercy. And our Heavenly Father always responds in mercy. He always responds to those who call out upon his name and you shall be saved. So repent and come to Jesus today. Amen. Would you pray with me? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your transforming power that comes through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We thank you that we have died to sin uh, in our union with Christ, that we are united to Christ in his death in, and, and, in his, and in his resurrection. And Lord, we pray that each one of us will experience this transforming power in our lives, in the way we live, in the way we think, in the, in the way we act. And Lord, we pray that you will help us to love you with all of our heart, soul and mind and to love our neighbour as you would have us love our neighbour. And so, Lord, we pray for this transforming power, this resurrection power to be each and every one of our experience. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.